first, uh, of course, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for uh, organizing this, this nice uh, conference and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about our uh, latest results uh, from our Koela beamline in uh, Darmstadt. And secondly, um, although I might look like, like a boxer currently, to my, I, I, I am not, <laughs> so I'm happy to discuss with you uh, afterwards and I promise I won't use my hands to argue, so uh, just to make this uh, clear. Okay, so my talk uh, today will be, uh, will be about uh, collinear laser spectroscopy. And uh, this is a technique which usually is used um, to, to investigate uh, atomic, uh, I don't know, nuclear ground state properties of radioactive nuclei. Um, so my talk will hopefully give you also or add um, a, a motivation and also a perspective which is more driven by, by uh, nuclear uh, physics. Um, but I try to keep everything really basic. Um, so I want to start um, with, uh, with a short reminder, which probably all of you know. Um, you can see here the, the nuclear chart. And um, if you want to describe the nuclei in the nuclear chart with uh, nuclear physics, um, you need some observables uh, where you can benchmark your, uh, your um, theory against. And uh, one main, um, one main uh, observable is the, the size of the nucleus. And uh, this is usually defined by the uh, mean square charge radius. And uh, if you want to measure now a nuclear charge radius, um, for example, for the stable ones, which, is, uh, which are marked in, in black here uh, for stable nuclei, um, you can use some of the uh, established techniques like electron scattering or uh, muonic atom spectroscopy. And as we just heard, also uh, laser spectroscopy, but unfortunately only for the, for the lightest isotopes right now. And if you want then investigate radioactive uh, isotopes, I mean, you need a measurement technique which is, which is fast from the production of the nuclei um, to, the, to the measurement because your, your nuclei uh, decay. So um, one, one um, main, main uh, technique here is collinear laser spectroscopy, um, which I will talk about. And so, but you can also use resonant ionization spectroscopy uh, in some form. And, what you do there is then you measure uh, the so-called isotope shift, um, which is basically um, the, the change of a transition frequency over an isotopic chain. And um, the, the origin of this, uh, of this uh, effect um, is, uh, or one part of this effect is the finite size effect uh, and the change of the, of the finite size of the nucleus. So, however, what we measure then is only the, the, the change of the nuclear size, but not the, the absolute value. So we always need a, need a reference nucleus in, in some of these change, uh, chains um, where the, the reference radius has been measured with, with another technique uh, to, to a high uh, accuracy or sufficiently uh, accuracy. And then we can, from this, we can, we then, can then calculate the, the, the um, charge radii of the, of the radioactive uh, nuclei. Okay, today I want to focus on the, on the lightest of nuclei um, because they have some really interesting features for, for nuclear physics, um, which are the so-called halo nuclei. Um, this is a special feature of, of light nuclei compared to, to the rest of the nuclear chart. And one um, main example is, is beryllium-11. And in the halo nuclei like beryllium-11, um, you have a beryllium-10 core and one neutron orbiting around this, around this core. And um, if you want to investigate this, and this has been done, um, you can now, as I explained, measure the isotope shift and then ask a theory um, to calculate the, the second part uh, or the second origin of the isotope shift, which is the so-called mass shift. And together with the mass shift, you can then extract uh, the finite size or the change of the nuclear charge radius. Um, and this has been done for beryllium, and with this you can then uh, nicely get out the, the, the halo, halo radius um, of, this, of this neutron. Um, however, in the end, as I said, you again need the reference radius for, for beryllium-9. Now, there is also a second, uh, a second halo, halo nucleus. I, I mean, they are not the only ones, but this uh, boron-8 is, is expected to be a so-called proton halo. Uh, halo. And this is, uh, again, unique in the, even in the regime of the halo nuclei. Because now you have a beryllium-7 core here and one proton orbiting around this, 
uh, around this core. Uh, right, sorry, yes. You're right. um, so um, if, you, if you want to investigate this one, um, you, you, have, uh, you, you can do, do the same um, of Boron 11. Um, I will measure the, the isotope shift um, uh, against uh, Boron 11, for example, um, and then get the change again uh, of the nuclear charge radius out of it. The, the problem is um, that you, or there are actually two problems. Uh, first problem is that there is no, there is no um, reference radius um, to, to a high accuracy available um, due to different reasons. Um, and the second one is um, you also you want to compare it to the to the to the beryllium um, to the beryllium core here to to get out the the um, the, the actual proton halo size. So what would be what would be uh, really nice um, is that you or what would be really nice is if you have all of these measurements based on the on the same experimental technique and also on the same theory, and not have to mix all the all these different techniques and with it also the different uh, systematic uncertainty. So um, the, the, the main motivation now for our work is now to, to gain information about this uh, proton halo size um, by, by setting all these all these nuclei on the on the same on the same footing. Um, yeah. So how can we do this? Um, I will get, just give a brief overview because I'm pretty sure that this will be explained also further in the, in the next talk after the break uh, by Vladimir Yerukin. But um, in principle with laser spectroscopy, you can measure the, the absolute nuclear charge radius um, by the, just by the finite size effect. So if you measure the, the real transition frequency and have a, and when you have a system then where you can actually calculate the, the transition frequency for a point like nucleus, you get out of the difference of these two of these two values should be then uh, proportional or should be the finite size and should be should be proportional to the to the mean square charge radius. Um, unfortunately, this has been so far only applied for for uh, hydrogen like um, hydrogen like systems, um, as we heard before. But um, we are, and this is also I think uh, Vladimir will talk about uh, in the next talk. Um, it's, it is now in reach. Uh, the, the QD calculations are now in reach to also um, get this to the to the level of two two electron systems. So we are talking now about about helium-like systems, helium and helium-like systems. Um, so this is, a, is is our goal. Um, you might ask now, okay, why why don't you do this in an ion trap um, where you have maybe just only a single ion, uh, where, where you have everything under control and and well defined, and where you could probably reach a much higher accuracy. Um, I, I, won't, I, I won't disagree with this, uh, but there is one problem in, in helium-like systems um, because in the, in the ground state of, of, of helium, um, there is the, the, the transition energy to the, to the next uh, excited state is so high, you cannot reach this with a, with a laser. Um, however, um, fortunately, there, is, there are these, these orthohelium states um, where both electron spins are, uh, are fairly aligned. And uh, so due to the Pauli principle, um, one electron has to sit in this triplet S state up here. And from there, we can now drive a transition um, to, to, a, to a higher state, to a, a triplet T state, and, and do a frequency measurement. Um, now, this triplet state, however, is, is a, is a, um, has a finite lifetime because it's a metastable state. And as you can see here in this table, um, that is is uh, what you can see here is that the lifetime actually decreases pretty fast with, with higher with higher Z. So um, helium and lithium should be still be able to be measured in a in an iron trap, but starting with beryllium, it it might it might get hard and maybe also impossible for boron and, and carbon just because the lifetime uh, is is so short. Um, so these these uh, um, these um, ions or these systems are now the, the goal of, 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 our, of our work. And the, the, main, the main point here is that we need a fast measurement technique again um, from the production of, IR, of our ions um, to the measurement. And this is now the, the direct connection point um, to, to our um, um, to nuclear physics because for the technique of collinear laser spectroscopy, it doesn't, 
it doesn't change if you have uh, quickly decaying nuclei or if you have metastable atomic states, um, which are quickly. Uh, Why you cannot use two singlet S? Uh, two singlet S uh, is is the yeah sorry it's a, it's it's a forbidden transition uh, and we are in collinear laser spectroscopy we just have a very short time where the ion is in our interaction region so slow transitions are very very hard or impossible uh, probably to measure. Two singlet S to triple P zero. Um, we we could we could do this um, but the problem there is that it's at first of all. It quickly de um, decays into the ground state from from the tr uh, from the single uh, p state, and the, and the, no, I'm talking about the transition to triplet p, from two singlet s to triplet p. Ah, okay. Um, I guess it's it's a forbidden transition. It's a forbidden yes, transition. yes, 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 yes. But it, it is the level of forbiddenness is go is going down for when you include the red state of x. By lifetime, you increase the life the lifetime is dropping, but yep. also the yeah, the transition is. Uh, uh, yeah, that's. It's a two-photon transition. Ah, thanks. 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 Um, thank you. <laughs> for, um, so um, we try to measure now these these uh, these transitions with collinear laser spectroscopy, and this is the point where I want to come to the to the to our setup actually to our Coela beamline. Um, if you're interested in details of our beamline, we had a we had a nice review paper in in a review of scientific instruments on 2020. Um, however, since then um, some some things changed or improved um, because um, to to get to to the to the or to be prepared for the for the higher uh, charged helium-like systems. Um, for example, we have improved our diagnostic stations to improve our ion and, and laser overlap. Um, we implemented a switchyard so we can have different ion sources, but uh, the, the main thing is that we now have an electron beam ion source, uh, which enables us to produce these, these helium-like systems. So I would say highly charged ions with re this uh, re respect to, to the nuclear charge. Uh, so not, nothing like uh, uranium-91+, uh, but uh, more like carbon-4+. So. Um, okay, so we produce our, our ions in, in our EBIS. And we form an ion beam, and which you can now overlap uh, with the with the laser beam, for example, in the, in the collinear direction. So that's why it's called collinear laser spectroscopy. Um, and then we can bring or tune our our laser, for example, in resonance with our with our ions, and detect the fluorescence light in our fluorescence detector. So, um, but there is one one main uh, physics effect which we have to which we have to care about. With, and this is the, the Doppler effect, the relativistic Doppler effect, because the ions are moving. So they're seeing a different laser, uh, laser, a different laser frequency in their rest frame. And um, so what we what we measure in the first place is the resonance frequency in the laboratory frame. But this is nothing we are interested in. We are interested in the in the rest frame transition frequency. So what we would need to know now is the velocity of, of the ions to calculate uh, back to the restaurant transition frequency. But this is not, this is not easy and, and not easy to do to determine this, this velocity to a high accuracy because of mainly because of the uncertainties in the, in the starting potential of the ions. Um, so what, what we do instead is we use a second laser beam um, as many laser uh, physics do or laser spectroscopy physics uh, do. Um, we use a second laser beam in the in the counter um, or in the anticollinear direction, um, and if we if we do a very very good overlap, and uh, then we can then we this 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 uh, this Doppler effect cancels out by measuring the the resonance frequencies in both directions, and um, um, in in the in the laboratory frame, and we get out directly the square of the of the rest frame transition frequency. And this is what we what we then basically do. Um, we we measure one direction. This takes this measurement usually takes a few minutes, depending on the on the system and how many ions you have. And then we measure the other direction, and then we start with with again with the same direction and measure the other again. And then always two two measurement directions give then one one measurement of the of the rest frame transition frequency. Um, so this is our basic principle, um, and we have we have shown this also in other systems. But this is now the first time we we tried to measure uh, helium-like uh, 
highly charged ion. And the important thing is here um, that um, what, what, what is different to, to, to regular singly, singly ionized ions is that you are very sensitive to any changes of your, of your high voltage or your generating voltage because you have highly charged ions. So the, the, differ, the differential Doppler shift, so, so the change of this uh, transition frequency uh, in, the, in the laboratory frame in regards to the change of the velocities uh, amplified by the, by the higher charge of the ions. So this makes things harder, just to put it like this. Um, so now we, done, we, we didn't directly start with boron or, or beryllium, which, which we want to measure, but we start with, uh, with carbon-12 because there are many, many good reasons for this. What you can see here is the, the nuclear charge radius uh, against the, the neutron number, and you can also see the nuclear charge radius of, of lithium and beryllium. But here is the, the main point, which, is, uh, which are the measurements of the nuclear charge radius of, of carbon-12. And as you can see here, we have really nice points also from, uh, from muonic um, uh, spectroscopy. Um, so this is, a, this is a nice nucleus where we can start with and do a proof of principle experiment and show that the theory uh, that the theory and also the experiment uh, work. Furthermore, um, it's easy, it's rather easy to produce an electron, electron beam ion source. Um, the transition wavelength of uh, 227 nanometers is already available. So we use a titanium sapphire laser, uh, which is uh, frequency quadrupled um, and is re referenced to a frequency comp. And uh, also, we uh, don't have a hyperfine structure in, in, in carbon-12, which is also really nice because this makes the experiment easier because you just have one, one transition. And uh, it also makes, as far as I know, the theory easy. OK, and this is what we, what, what we just did uh, beginning, of this, uh, beginning of this year. Um, you have this, this triplet system here. And we started with the 3P2 transition. And you can see up here a, a typical a typical transition um, of, of the of our spectrum of, of uh, the 3p2 transition and just in one direction um, and this is the actually the strongest the strongest transition um, in in the system so this is also uh, why we use this transition to investigate our systematics uh, our systematics and so on and uh, what you can see down here are now all the the single measurements we did as like where we said, okay, we are doing everything as good as we can. So our like our real measurements, um, and you, maybe you cannot in, in the back you cannot see the numbers uh, quite well, but um, the, the scale here is up to uh, 30 megahertz, and the band here is a, a, a light uh, blue band, um, which is um, which is our current our current systematic main uh, systematic uncertainty, uh, which is dominated by the laser laser overlap basically. And the, this this is, uh, has a size of about two megahertz. Um, to give the, you a, re, uh, a relation uh, to this, um, we in the beginning we aimed for about one megahertz um, accuracy, um, which would result in a together with a with a comparable um, theory, which would result in a really nice um, and, um, and acu accurate um, um, charge radius. Okay, so this is. Um, it basically, this, this transition would be enough um, now to, to investigate the nuclear charge radius, but uh, of course, for also for consistency reasons, um, we, we measured also the, the other two um, transitions, where the 3P0 is the, the weakest um, transition, and which you also can see in the, in the statistics of the, of the data points. And, um, and the, in the middle, there is the 3P1 transition. Um, but in, in all transitions, the main uncertainty is, is, is really the, the overlap of our, of our uh, two lasers, um, which, which, we, which we know what the, the problem there is, and, and we have some, some ideas to even improve this, this further. Okay, um, so, so we uh, did the measurements. Um, as far as I know, the calculations uh, for, for, for the nuclear charge rates or for the QD is, is, is in progress. Um, we hope we, we can... We, we can um, we can publish a value there in, in, in the near future, and now um, in in the in the last minutes uh, of my talk, I, I want to guide you through um, our plans now towards the the boron uh, the boron eight uh, measurements or yeah. So um, first of all, uh, our next steps in, in carbon um, are now so we measured the, um, the 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 triplet states here in in the in the helium-like system. Um, together with theory, 
um, we hopefully get out a, a nice uh, nuclear charge radius, which we can then compare um, to already established uh, measurements, like from the muonic measurements or, or electron scattering. Um, and in the next step, um, we, we can also measure carbon-13, which is the next step towards, uh, towards the, 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 the um, boron and, and beryllium measurements, because now we also have a hyperfine structure, and in all other nuclei, we also have, have to deal with hyperfine structure, which makes the experiment a little bit harder, uh, and, and also, also the theory. So this will be also a nice test then, because we get out a, a nuclear charge radius for carbon-13, and now we can still, I mean, we basically have measured the isotope shift as well in, in the same time, and then we can use the, the regular conventional mass shift, mass shift calculations um, to, to compare both, uh, both results uh, against each other to then compare um, also, also theory and to make sure that everything is consistent here. Um, further plans might be that at some point um, we, we also might get out or we might be able to do measurements on, on, in an online facility, uh, but this is really like a, like a long term, uh, like a long term. So to, to, to come back now to the main motivation, which is the, the Boron 8, um, I, there is a, there is a, like a pathway um, towards this. So as I said, we need the, the radius for Boron 8 and uh, the radius for, for, for Beryllium 7. Um, so um, what, what already has been measured is the, the conventional way, so the, the, the conventional isotope shift in Boron um, 10 and 11. And we have a, a change of the nuclear charge radius between 10 and 11. And on the beryllium side, we also, uh, also already measured the change of the nuclear charge radius between um, beryllium 7 and, and 9 um, in, in the conventional isotope shift measurement. Um, so the next step here is now, of course, to measure the, the helium-like system if, and, and, the, and the charge radius of, of boron 10 uh, and 11 uh, via the... Uh, the the um, helium-like uh, system. But uh, furthermore, uh, so from this, we can also get the, the change of the nuclear charge radius and, and make, make a consistency check with our, our previous measurements. But we, as I said, in, in carbon, we again measure here by itself the, the, the isotope shift in this two-electron system. And together with the, with the conventional mass shift, mass shift calculations in two-electron systems, we can again check again all this, also this value. And there is a, a third consistency check, actually, which, which we can do, because we can also measure the isotope shift in, in boron 2 plus, uh, because this is still, still available um, with, with some laser efforts. Um, so we can use here a, a usual ground state um, transition from the, from the 2s1 half to the uh, 2p1 half and 3 half um, in, in boron 2 plus to then again um, measure the isotope shift here and check this, this value here. Um, and then finally, these measurements are in preparation. Of course, we need to, at some point, we need to measure the, the, the isotope shift and the, and the change of the nuclear charge radius in boron 8 with uh, regards to boron 11. And with this, with this value, then we hopefully, um, with these, these uh, reference measurements, we then hopefully get out the, the charge radius of the boron 8. Um, and the same on the other side, um, we want to provide also uh, the reference radius uh, for boron-9 um, in, in the same matter. Um, so um, the plan here is also to measure then the, 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 um, the nuclear charge radius from the, from the helium-like uh, system in beryllium-9. And together with the isotope shift measurements, uh, the older isotope shift measurements, we will hopefully get out then also a nice value for uh, beryllium-7. And this will be then really interesting for, for, the, for the proton, for the determination of the proton halo and the uh, halo effective field theory in, in nuclear physics. So I hope uh, I, I convinced you that this is uh, at least uh, to some part interesting. And, and also we have a lot of consistency checks, which should be also interesting for, for the uh, QD um, theory. Um, so we can, we can have a nice, nice um, synergy between, between nuclear and nuclear physics and, and uh, atomic physics and make a lot of a lot of consistency checks here. So in, in conclusion, um, we, we, we started uh, with, this, with this campaign. We are working uh, towards uh, the, the determination of, um, of the carbon, um, the carbon um, charge radius to, to make a comparison and to, to establish measurements. 
Um, um, but then the next steps will be then towards the, the proton, uh, proton halo of foreign eight. Um, we, we can make, as I said, a lot of consistency checks and maybe at some point we, we might also be uh, able to measure uh, nitrogen um, and also some on online isotopes with, uh, with a lot of effort. Of course. Yes. So with this, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and also uh, thank uh, my colleagues, uh, which of course help a lot uh, with these measurements. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? I have a simple question. I think the nuclear physicists probably can make an estimate of the radius of the hollow states. How accurate they are? Uh, I, I cannot tell you the, the current um, um, prediction, but they are, uh, they, are not, uh, they are not too bad. If, if, you comp if you would compare this to, to our, or translate this in the isotope shift measurement, you will see a steep increase in, 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 in the isotope shift. Um, so this, the, the prediction should be clear enough, but I don't know if, if Trey can add to this. Uh, Gordon. Yep. Uh, let, let allow me just but, for people are sitting on site. Uh, means, yeah. uh, I will give you the. Um, so thanks for the talk. Uh, maybe I missed this, but like, uh, why exactly can't you uh, have the ion trapped in an ion trap and then do a spectros spectroscopy on them? Okay. so. Basically, you, you could trap, uh, for example, uh, I don't know, carbon-4+, plus. but the problem is if you want to do laser spectroscopy um, in, the, in, in this triplet state, the, the, the lifetime of your, of your uh, triplet S state is very short-lived. So in the time where you trap your ion, it will be decayed or it will, be, it will, it will be no longer be in, the, in, the, in this triplet state and you cannot perform the laser spectroscopy anymore. So it's just about the, about the time you need to measure uh, your your transition and this is too long to to be made in a trap yeah uh, yeah this is a, a, as a comment following on from the, the previous uh, question uh, since the uh, the electrons don't see the neutrons the effect is relatively small for the neutron halo nuclei but it should be huge yeah. for the case of a proton uh, halo because of course the uh, the electrons yeah. see the proton yeah yeah right so and, and again if there's a theoretical Prediction for that would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I cannot. I cannot uh, tell you this. <laughs> yeah. So this is sort of yeah a follow up question on this. What's actually been measured? If I look quickly, it's is it the only constraint on this on the the actual size of the proton halo is from the measurement of GSI? So proton elastic scattering. Is that right? Where they sorry the, get the differential differential cross sections from proton elastic scattering. This would be the the current best measurement of the proton radius, the the pro, the, the which, how the, the proton halo in boron. Okay, is so is that true or is there a better? So as far as I know, there is actually no measurement of the of the charge radius of. Well, it depends what you eight. call a measurement, right? Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, but, but you 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 claim that there was some scattering experiments. So you can they they, they you can probe the so the halo structure of boron eight. You can look at proton elastic scattering and inverse kinematics. So this is a GSI, and you look at differential cross section and you fit with a model for different assuming different radii um, and so I guess yeah the question was how what's of course you're going to be able to go much farther than that okay um, um, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not sure about the about the about the boron oh, I'm not aware of the boron eight measurements actually but the electron scattering in in boron is rather it's complicated boring. because you have a because you have an overlap of, of different uh, of different scattering phases which which where you don't see these these minima which you usually uh, which you usually see um, uh, and which determines also your 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 nuclear charge radius you don't see these in, in boron anymore um, so this is also the reason why the the also for for the stable for the stable boron um, you all only have like um, charge radio with very large uncertainties. Um, so I guess this, this might be. Can I have a, I have a, can I, can I have a second question? I have a second <laughs> please, related please, question. Excuse please. Me. Um, just briefly, you showed a, a, new, a global scheme at the end mm -hmm. and you showed related measurements at Argonne with Guy yeah. Saval and company. Yeah. What exactly, could you just comment briefly on exactly what yeah. that is? Yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, so, um, 
I'm also a little bit involved in this. Um, we are we are trying to set up there also a collinear laser spectroscopy setup, and then measure the the isotope shift in in the in the regular way. So measuring and the the isotope shift between boron 11 and boron 8 then, which gives us um, as I explained the the change of the nuclear charge radius, or should give us here, and uh, then together with the with the refer reference radius from from boron 11. We then hope to get out the, the charge radius of four and eight. And this is in preparation. So, I will give you a talk, but we have now a question from the online the online attender. So let me ask the question and then we will continue. Uh, from Sergey Bubin. Uh, it is is it possible to make similar measurements for ca uh, carbon two plus double charge carbon instead of uh, carbon four plus? Um, I have to look in the in the in the actual level scheme. Um, I it, it might be possible, um, but I think the 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 problem is uh, it depends what you want to do with this. Because I I, mean, uh, I, I I can answer this question <laughs> because I know what uh, what yeah. you mean. So that <laughs> it means uh, because uh, Sergey Bubin is doing accurate calculation with, with the four electron system, so he can calculate the isotope shift. Yeah. So if you're able to calculate the, uh, to measure the isotope shift for mm -hmm. the four electron systems, similarly but like, like what you have done for five electrons. Yeah. yeah. Then uh, okay. the, the question has the, the, the implicit answer that he can do this calculation. Okay. Yeah, I have to look in the in the level scheme actually. If when the when there is a transition when, which is optically allowed and we have the laser system for that, this is possible. Yeah. So think about this because yes. the, okay. means the high precision calculation can be performed for the four, even for five. But it, for five, it takes years. Okay. But for four, it means on top of the year you can do the calculation. Okay. Uh, for the questions, or oh, there are many of them, uh, please. Thanks. Um, I maybe I missed it, but what's the accuracy in the charge radius you're expecting in the absolute? One percent, zero point one percent. Um, it's it's about uh, for for carbon it, with the one megahertz, we would have like zero point one percent with the matching uh, with the matching uh, okay. calculations. All right. So the the other isotopes of carbon charge radii, I know to measure that well with neonic X rays. Yeah. Also for on and everyone else, so you cannot test against it. You will just you will determine the radii best, but. You cannot test against them. Only yeah. carbon twelve, especially. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, boron eleven, uh, the best one you get from pionics, pion scattering, but okay. that's only two percent. Okay. Then, if you want a prediction of boron eight, you can use. It's not published, but you can use the mirror transition, the mirror uh, from lithium eight. You can get yeah. it, but yeah. it's limited by lithium eight. Yeah. Uh, so there, there is a lot of interesting stuff. I have a simple question. What is the order of magnitude of the Doppler effect that you compensate or the speed of your ions? Uh, so the speed of our ions is really low. <laughs> so um, so the energy, I can, I can tell you the energy. So the energy is about uh, with, um, of about 10 kilo electron volts per charge. And if you, if you then calculate this um, in, in, the, in the shift of, of your transition frequency, you're about of one one nanometer to to one and a half nanometers maybe in in the different directions is this the, the value you. okay <laughs> yes yeah i was just uh wondering i mean peter muller uh, uh, measured already um uh, helium six and helium eight uh um isotope shift with respect to helium four which we have now slightly improved but the limiting mm -hmm. factor is and, and there they have also 100 millisecond lifetime so in principle this would match you right so you could also go and trap your your ions in a in a similar setup um, in argon. Yeah, but I, I mean um, you, you you can try at least yes. Thank you. I think oh, it's the last question. Okay, but yeah, because we are little of, of time. So. You mentioned um, a target uncertainty level of one megahertz. Is this kind of a fundamental technical limitation? Um, no, <laughs> it is uh, just. I mean, you have to aim for something in the beginning, <laughs> and we we just looked. Okay, how how good is the the uh, so if we can come to one megahertz, um, just from the estimation of our old measurements, 
um, how good can are we then in the in the in the charge radius and we just we just set, aim for that so but of course so now we after we done we've done the first measurements we can say that we can actually maybe we can we can even uh, become better um, with with some improvements of the of the technique uh, and yeah then let's see how how, how good we can get. So. Do you have a number what is achievable there? This kind of <laughs> okay, I, I mean, I, I can give you the I can give you the the natural line width of, of this of this transition, which is about ten megahertz. Um, ah, so now okay. you can say, okay, yeah, okay, it, it, it limits your. It your yeah. 